Have you ever wanted someone to leave so badly, so much that you would pay them? Do anything, just leave. Hi, this is Daryl Chesser with Sea Life TV. Thank you for joining me. Today, we are going to uh, read one of the things I wrote recently, and it's called, Please Leave. Just leave. Let's get started. It starts with a verse out of Psalms, and it says, He, God, brought forth Israel also with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. And that's in Psalms 105, verse 37, and that's the Amplified. Not one feeble person among them. Wow. Loaded up with silver and gold. Somebody was willing to pay a lot of resources to get those people gone. That's, yeah, okay, well, let's read on. Israel, who had been enslaved for a couple of hundred years, they'd been since Abraham's, the promise to Abraham about the promised land, from the, the day they went out was 430 years after that. So all of that down through Jacob and then to get to Israel and Joseph, and, and then, so a couple of hundred years, over a couple of hundred years of slavery after they turned on the children of Israel there in Egypt. This is where the condition Israel was at right now. They'd multiplied immensely. And now uh, the, the country had turned on him. You know, what have you done for me lately? Now it's bad, 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 bad. They're enslaved. So Israel had been enslaved for a couple of hundred years now in Egypt, and they were delivered by God through Moses and Aaron. When they left Egypt rather suddenly, the Bible tells us that they walked out wealthy and healthy. Not one feeble one among them. Imagine that. An enslaved people overnight walk out of enslavement, not only free, but wealthy. And on top of that, there was not one feeble person among them. Maybe you don't know what the word feeble means, but it means in any way infirmed or, or hobbled or uh, handicapped or handicapable or it, you know, in other words, you're, you're not ready for a 40-year walk, walk around, or as they say, down under, a walkabout. Just imagine, well, let me give you this. Just imagine um, uh, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, or Fort Worth, Texas, either one, those are the two I'm familiar with over the past many years. The whole population of either one of those cities, one day being asked to leave, the entire population, you know, one or two million people, that entire uh, population surrounding the city and, 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 and its immediate neighbors there in the county. One or two million people just get out, here's all our money, and go. Imagine these one or two million people walking out of the hospitals, walking out of their homes, walking out of their schools, out of their jobs, and uh, picking up gold and silver all along the way, and clothing and articles, and the people are saying, go, just go, just go. And everybody's healthy and whole. I mean, they're not taking buses or trains. They're loaded up their stuff they're carrying on carts and or donkeys and or cattle or ox, whatever, and they're out. This means the infirm, the elderly, the sick, the young, not one feeble person among them. Let's read on. Wow. So how could this be? How could all of those people be strong and wealthy overnight? How could that be? I'll give you a hint. And it does not in any way involve bunnies or eggs. Not chocolate, not pink, not dyed, not in any way bunnies. No bunnies, real or imagined. 
The night before they left Egypt, all of Israel were instructed to sacrifice a spotless lamb for each household. They were to brush the blood on the doorpost of the house and then cook and eat the flesh of that slain lamb. The night before they left Egypt, the Israelites woke up to the Egyptians imploring them to leave. Just leave after this happened. Just leave. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. The Egyptians even threw their gold, silver, precious stones, and fine clothing at them and hurried them out of town. Egypt lay in ruins after a series of catastrophes and coincidences. No, no, there was no coincidence that they were destroyed. It was no coincidence, coincidence at all. God had offered opportunity after opportunity for the Egyptians to let his people go. But after nine appeals by Moses to them to release God's people, the Pharaoh still refused to release them. The tenth appeal from Moses involved a destroying angel set loose on the firstborn of Egypt. This appeal sealed Israel's release. Let's read. Out of, uh, let's see, I'm going to read out of Exodus 12, and I'm going to read 29 through 39. This is out of the NIV. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Ouch. You know, my house, my dad was a firstborn, my mom was a firstborn, and my sister, my only sister, sibling, is a firstborn. That night, I would have been decimated without the blood. My family would have been just gone. And I'm the firstborn grandson on both sides, so I don't know if that counted. <laughs> Hopefully not. Well, anyway, that's moot. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was a loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house, not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, get out, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord if you, as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds, and as, as you have said, go. Oh, and also bless me. <laughs> That's funny. Pharaoh goes, and also bless me. Wow. <clears throat> okay. So the people took their dough, not just, not money. We're talking actual dough for bread. They were going to let rise. You know, you put yeast in it and then let it rise and bake it. But they didn't have time to do that. They were instructed not to. They, they left in such a hurry. Well, listen, they took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. So the people, uh, the Lord made the Egyptians, so the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people of Israel and they, the Egyptians, gave them what they asked for. So Israel plundered Egypt that day. The Israelites journeyed then from Ramses to Sukkoth, Sukkoth, there were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Many other people went with them as well, and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread, or uh, think of it as pita bread or some of that kind of stuff that they don't add leaven. It's, it's more like a pancake. It's flat, flat bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Wow, there's a lot to speak about here. But let's move on. The spectacular, awe-inspiring acts of our Heavenly Father for His children are just stunning. Spectacular. If God can do this for an entire nation of people, just imagine what he can do for you and your household. When you receive communion, remember this story of the first Passover, the first communion of what it was pointing to. 
It was pointing to the blood of the perfect lamb, Jesus Christ, who was to come and to be put on that cross. That perfect lamb shed his blood and his blood was put on that cross on the doorposts of the world and of our hearts. And that flesh, that body of his, was then ripped apart on the way to that cross. And then on that cross, he was judged. The entire judgment and wrath of God came out on him for the sins of the world, the sickness, disease was put upon him, the curse by being put on that cross, all of it put on him. And he was judged, baked, cooked, roasted, the burnt offering, boom. He was done. And that flesh is the flesh that the Israelites ate that night, the roasted lamb that had suffered the judgment, had suffered the wrath for their sin, that the death angel went over their house, had to pass over their house because of the lamb, because of the blood of that lamb. And because they ate the flesh of that lamb as instructed, it received, they received strength for the journey. They received not one feeble person, one person among them. They walked out well and whole and wealthy and joyfully rushed out of that land. As a result of that first communion, that was only a shadow. That birthed a brand new nation. A brand new nation walked out of that uh, Egypt that day. Today, because of Jesus' blood spilled out and his body beaten and crucified, the destroying angel of condemnation and sin and death, poverty and lack, sickness and disease must pass over our household. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Today could be moving day for you and your family. It could be moving day for you and your health or your wealth or your debt or lack or your despair. Today could be that day because of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. I want to do communion with you uh, quickly today to show the, dyna the dynamics. In other words, uh, how do I say this? If that regular lamb, his blood and his body destroyed for the people, imagine what the real, the true lamb of God the perfect Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, the Son of God who willingly came and for this purpose to be that Lamb. And when we come to communion, when we offer up this communion that Jesus did with his disciples, we pick up that blood and we've examined ourselves and we say, Father, if there is any self-righteousness in me, if there is anything in any way that I'm coming to this table today or living my life with any other thing except for trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone. If I've exalted my works or deeds, if I've exalted uh, any other factor in my life that makes me worthy to take this, then that's taking this body and blood unworthy. The only way in an unworthy manner, it says, the person's not unworthy, it says it's an unworthy manner. How are you taking it? He was speaking to people that were getting drunk in the communion, you know, and weren't sharing their meals. They were showing off. They were doing all kinds of stuff. There's people who take the communion just to look good, you know, come and take your communion, kneel and do and feel sorry and do all that stuff. That's an unworthy manner, brother. He says, if you're not discerning the body of Christ, if you're not discerning where this came from, it was this broken body, as Jesus said. He took the bread and he broke it himself. This was him he was talking about. He knew what was coming. The disciples did not yet know. This body, which was broken, just like that lamb on the first Passover, 
broken apart, ripped apart. An innocent lamb. He didn't, it, he had nothing to do with it. But he was chosen and a family selected him. And this body was broken. And because of that, this family was set free. This family was strengthened. Their legs strengthened, their backs strengthened. They walked out with silver and gold and clothes and freedom. The next day, they walked out. They couldn't even finish baking their bread. So today we take this body of Jesus Christ, the, the bread represents this, and we break it as Jesus himself did, and we bless it. and We say, Father, in Jesus' name, we bless this bread. Multiply it. Multiply the effects of this lamb, the flesh, the roasted lamb of God, this flesh that on the Passover strengthened those people. And bring strength to all of your body. Bring strength to all of the sons and daughters of God. All who take this in a worthy manner. They remember your body that was whipped. That was striped for our healing. That was pierced and bruised and battered for our sin and our iniquity. That was uh, uh, put up on that cross and became a curse for us. Even in Corinthians, Paul writes, He that was rich became poor, humiliated, naked, ashamed, accused, humiliated. He became poor so that we who were in our poverty might be made rich today. We who were in our slavery to sin and death and sickness and, and debt and every other thing. He took that on himself, the entire judgment and wrath, so that we could eat this lamb and remember Jesus Christ came for that purpose. He was a flesh, blood, and bone man that was born of a woman and walked this earth. And he came for this reason, to go to that cross. So we remember that today. And we eat this bread that God is multiplying right now, strength and health and provision and wholeness to my city, to my state, to my household, to me, to my country to my neighbors in the name of Jesus Christ. We're free and we get, we eat, we eat this lamb today. Praise God. Sorry, talking with my mouth full. Now, uh, you know, over the years, many, many people we've talked to, great people, um, they are saying, well, don't you have to be a clergyman to serve the communion or ordained or licensed or I don't know. I was not raised that way. I don't see it in the Bible. Um, I think that any time you can take whatever it is you want, depending on your viewpoint, wine, grape juice, water, it doesn't. It is the faith of obeying the Lord Jesus Christ in this receiving communion, understanding Every time you do this, you're speaking to the Gnostics and to the demons and to the unbelieving of the world. And we're saying, flesh body, this flesh body of Christ Jesus was broken for us. It was battered. It was bruised. It was beaten. And don't make any mistake. That body was done for me, for this body. I don't need healing or wealth in heaven. I get a brand new body. And the streets are gold. Now, some people think that's figuratively, can't you just believe the Bible? I mean, if you believe there's a some kind of sky god who created the earth, I mean, is it a stretch to think maybe the city streets are gold? I mean, how, how much of a stretch? Seriously, quit trying to be intellectual and just believe what God says. Anyway, let's go to the blood. And after supper, the... The, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took the cup and he said, this is the cup of my blood in the new covenant. The cup of his blood in the new covenant. Grapes are smashed, you know, to make wine, they're smashed and stepped on and, and crushed and just squeezed out of that grape. It represents everything that happened to Jesus on his way to that cross. This was the one element that was critical for our eternity for our forgiveness was the blood to be spilled. 
everything else on the way to that cross, that was for something else. That was atonement of our flesh here while we're living, that we can have his provision and his healing and, and all of these things that he, was, he, he, was, he took the beating for until we get to heaven. This was to wash our sins away. This was to renew our life. Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. So we take this to honor and remember it was his blood. The life of God himself running through Jesus Christ was spilled onto this earth for us. And when we drink this blood, we're remembering that. And we're saying, this is how I was cleansed. This is how I live. This is what keeps me washed. This is what has given me eternal life. It is his thing. It is his sacrifice. It is his life. It is his grace, not me. So as uh, I believe the Hebrews say, uh, if I'm misquoting it, I, 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 uh, uh, I apologize, but l'chaim, to life and shalom, peace and wholeness. This blood, this cup, this blood of the grape, this blood of the grape represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me say one more, one more thing. You know why Jesus said don't drink, not Jesus, but Moses, why God commanded them not to drink the blood of animals? Because that's idolatry. It's plain and simple. It's a real simple thing. Now, I know many Hebrews may get hung up on that, but I'm saying those animals were pointing to Christ. They were not, the, the life wasn't coming from them. You drink the blood of animals, that, no. That's a created life. Jesus Christ, his blood, this is the only thing that could give you eternal life. Don't get caught up in idolatry. If you're doing communion as idolatry, just as a symbol, Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 11, many are weak and sickly and die prematurely. Believers, because they are taking in an unworthy manner. They're not discerning, hey, wait a minute. This is, there's actually benefit to this. It's not just a ceremony. It's just, just not for me to go there and look good as a businessman because I took communion. Now everybody thinks I'm a good guy. That's bad. So to life, to peace, to wholeness, l'chaim, shalom, God is good. Praise God. All right, sorry for taking so much time. Uh, God is good. He, he came to set you free, just like he did the Israelites that night. He came to uh, enforce this, the death angel, the destroying angel has to go around and over you. God is good. Believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Christ and he sees Christ when he's looking at me then he's pleased we see the culture of the kingdom is actually actually the fruit of the spirit it is nothing that I have done but God has done it all so receive good news today it is only from the Word of God that faith comes and I keep hearing his voice saying Jan I got this so I'm here to tell you he's got it this is where a different kind of grace enters in it's the grace that says I know you are and I'm gonna bless you anyway. From all of us at Sea Life Ministries. Happy New Year!